All right, so panels, this has intrigued me to no end in the last few years because whenever I have been talking or others have been talking about different types of methods that can be used, the big question we always get is, well, can you use competitive dialogue? Can you use um, competitive negotiations? Can you use some of these other things like innovation partnerships, these other methods that are out there if it has not been legislated? And my answer to that is, well, panels are not legislated, but yet everybody's using it. Now, National Treasury have uh, got some information on panels that they have included in, in the past. And this is um, a little bit more recent than, than the guide, which I'll share with you now. And it's just as, uh, from the Vulekamali uh, site. Um, sometimes the RFP process may be utilized to establish a panel of service providers wherein the bidders will be evaluated for functionality and compliance requirements, excluding pricing. And then when the organ of state assesses or procures from the panel, all service providers on the panel will be asked to provide a quotation for their services because the bidders will be evaluated for functionality, uh, have already been evaluated for functionality before. So um, that's that's a description of it. In the 2005 guide, uh, this is the PFMA guide, very similar in the MFMA guide, where consulting services are required on a recurring basis, a panel of consultants slash list of approved service providers for the rendering of these services may be established. And that is all that I know that has been, that I'm aware of that has been issued by Treasury on panels, but yet everybody is using it. Let's just quickly pause for a little bit. And I'm not going to go through the detail here, but here are some definitions of panels from around the world. And I'm going to quickly mention the countries where these definitions come from. A panel arrangement is a way to procure goods or services regularly acquired by entities and a panel arrangement suppliers have been appointed to supply goods or services for a set period of time and agreed terms and conditions, including agreed pricing. A panel is a form of standing offer established with multiple suppliers for the anticipated provision of goods, anticipated provision of goods or services as and when required. That Those two definitions are from Australia, two different parts of Australia. These two definitions are from New Zealand, a panel contract, a type of framework agreement that governs the relationship between the agency and each panel supplier. A panel of suppliers is a list of suppliers that an organization has selected as being able to deliver the goods or services that the organization needs and with whom the organization has agreed terms and conditions of supply. That's from New Zealand. This is a very authoritative book by uh, Juan Luigi Albano and Caroline Nicholas um, on framework agreements. And this is the bottom line. A panel contract, also referred to as a panel arrangement, is a contractual arrangement established between at least two suppliers for the anticipated provision of goods or services as and when required over a specified period of time. The panel contract contains standard terms and conditions. Uh, it may be mandatory, voluntary. We're going to get into a couple of those things just now. The bottom line is that the only countries in the world, based on my research, that use panels and refer to them as panels is South Africa, Australia, and New Zealand. I don't know why it's those three countries, but as far as the reach is concerned that I've done so far, those are the only ones that use panels. What does the rest of the world use? They use framework agreements. In fact, the framework agreement type of arrangement used in Australia known as panel contracts, may be a closed framework agreement, Model 1, Model 2, but occasionally an open one, Model 3. I'm going to talk about this a little bit more, but basically here, here we have um, some of the most respective academics in public procurement in the world. Caroline Nicholas is one of the architects behind the unicitral model law that has been put together. 
Jean Luigi, very senior in, in Europe, has said framework agreements, or sorry, sorry, panel contracts are framework agreements. Uh, in fact, it's synonymous. It's the, it, it is really the same thing. Um, now, there might be some different perspectives to it, but, but framework agreements are used in South Africa. It's used, they are used particularly in the construction industry. Here are some definitions from some of the, the contract forms. Um, framework agreements are used internationally. These are the three different types that the UNCTRL model law uses. Uh, it, it is also, framework agreements is also used extensively in Europe. These are two definitions around, around that. Let me just pause here. An agreement between one, one or more contracting authorities, one or more, and one or more economic operators, the purpose of which is to establish the terms governing contracts to be awarded during a given period, in particular with regard to price and where appropriate the quantity envisaged. Very interesting. What does North America use? They don't use framework agreements, nor do they use panels. They use what, something called indefinite delivery, indefinite quantity contracts. These are very, very similar to framework agreements and panels. Um, they used extensively in North America. Um, the pre precise quantities of supplies or services that the government will require during the contract period. They govern. So they're basically saying indefinite delivery. We don't know where. We don't know when. We don't know what quantity. That's a panel. But when we need it, we want to be able to call on you to deliver the quantity of the goods that are required. So... If, if you were to, and I had a discussion in, in some training that we were giving to an institution on panels and framework agreements recently, and one of the questions they had is, is why is it that when they go out internationally asking people to join a panel, they don't get a great response? Well, one of the reasons is because around the world in government procurement circles, it is only three areas that use panels, South Africa, Australia, New Zealand. In, um, in the construction industry, certainly frameworks are far better understood as, as the, the vehicle that would achieve what a panel would achieve. Framework agreements are better understood in Europe, Asia, South America. If you want to go out and do a, uh, a panel for and invite possible uh, international suppliers to be part of the panel, don't call it a panel. Call it a framework particularly if, if the suppliers are in Europe and Asia. If you're targeting potential suppliers that are in North America, don't call it a panel. Call it an IDIQ, indefinite delivery, indefinite quantity. Those, those are the different terms that are used around the world for this, this vehicle that we, we speak about in South Africa called a panel. Now, why do we use panels? There are a whole range of, of reasons, but, but if, if you were to ask... Uh, simply people to say, what are the benefits of panel? It is because we are able to very quickly appoint a supplier to do a piece of work as and when needed. We don't have to go through a tender process, but yet we can use a quotations process and it can be above the quotations threshold if we use a panel to appoint them for that. They're effective because we've already gone through a process to qualify those bidders that are on the panel. We've checked their functionality. We've checked their capabilities. We've done the basic checking that they're on CSD and a whole range of other aspects, and they get put onto the panel. So um, we follow an open competitive process to put them on the panel. And then once they're there, we can follow a more restricted process, if you like, by using the quotations process to get it done. And it's something that we could use over a period of time without necessarily committing to the suppliers that we're going to give them work. If it's a two-year panel arrangement, we're not committing, we're not contracting with them to say, hey, you supplier A, we're going to give you one million rands worth of work over the next year. There's no commitment like that to any value of work or quantum of work that might be there. And, and if we have a panel of service providers for legal, for 
uh, breakdown maintenance for facilities management for a whole range of things. I'm not going to go through those now. Many many people on will will know what the different commodities are that uh, you can use panels for. There's a massive range of them. Then once you put that panel together, when you need the work, you can quickly contract with a supplier to get going. If you have a suddenly get called to appear in court tomorrow on an injuncture that a supplier has has pulled out, you can't go through a tendering process to appoint the legal firm that's going to use be used to represent you in court tomorrow. That can't be done. So we need another mechanism. And that's one of the great benefits of panels is it allows you, us to do that. But there are challenges. And I welcome your input on these challenges. One of the often the ones that is often mentioned in in discussions that we have is, uh, and this is both on the on the um, the bidder side as well as the as the institution side, is very often it appears that it's there's only one or two bidders bidders that regularly win in that second stage, um, and and that's probably the most frequent one is that there are bidders in there on that panel that that initially are quite excited to be on the panel they would submit quotations but they start to realize that they're not getting it and so they start to get this what i call quotation fatigue in the second stage i've submitted x number of quotations over the last year shucks i've got nothing i'm wasting my time with these quotations it probably happens a lot quicker than than a year and so they stop submitting quotations and we get that uh, that fatigue and then sometimes we we face possible audit queries because we've we've got this panel we go out there uh, we're expected to get sometimes uh, three quotations we don't get that and and then we we have possible audit queries one of the other things is that if we have different categories within a within a panel so if it's legal for example we've got um, you know criminal law lot or category we've got an intellectual property law category we've got a commercial law category we've got all these different categories there that what often happens is we have a skewed number of qualifiers in the different lots so we might have you know uh, 50 uh, bidders in the criminal law category and we've only got one in intellectual property and um, that becomes one of the difficulties as well in that i've seen many panels that go out there and they ask for prices but um, prices typically in in panels only come in in the second round and and so very often in um i've seen suppliers just wondering why is it that we ask for for um for prices and um and and in the evaluation committees themselves they start asking that question and then one of the 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 frequent issues is that once we've got the panel we have to then figure out how we're going to rotate and that is very seldom thought through and disclosed in the initial tender documents one of the risks of panels is that the suppliers, the bidders on those panels eventually know who it is that is on the panel as well. And there is a risk of collusion, particularly in that second stage. And that risk increases the longer the panel is going. And one of the big the big issues is that there is just because there's no legislation on on panels the policies in the institutions are very often weak. And so we get we very often get uh, difficulties putting the panels together. We know we're not not always a hundred percent sure if if um, our policies are right, how we should be doing it. And so very often there there are some of the the issues that we see with panels. There are probably many others. I know that I'm thinking of um, one that we received an email on quite recently on panels. These are the typical challenges. Now, I have got a separate topic that I've run that talks about the legislation that is in place today, middle of June, 2024, in South Africa, that governs the use of methods which have not been legislated. 
I'm quickly going to go through these now just as a, as a bit of a recap. But uh, on the YouTube channel, there is more of a discussion on this. The first one is, of course, the initial stage. You've got to advertise this on the eTender publication portal. This typically applies to, to both um, PFMA Schedule 2s and, uh, and 3Bs and 3Cs and, and departments, constitutional entities, local government, etc. Very interesting, though, is um, if, if you have a look at the legislation the procedures from the time that a tender is invited to the time that a tender is awarded must be disclosed in the tender documents. Figuring out what your rotation method is going to be only once you've put the panel together is not transparent, is not fair. You need to be sure that the procedures throughout have been included in the procurement documents because uh, the definition of an acceptable tender is one that meets the conditions of tender. Conditions of tender is defined as includes the procedures from the time the tender is invited to the time the tender is awarded as a condition of tender. And the other the other requirement, and this is from case law, is that that um, your conditions in the tender cannot be immaterial, unreasonable, un unconstitutional. And noting that functionality is no longer included in in the Preferential Procurement Regulation 2022. The final award has to be currently on the 9010-8020. And, and, um, and if, if, um, if not, then you can use Objective Criteria 21F to make the final award. Finally, the award must be published. And then uh, if you don't award through or, or put people on the panel without following an open competitive advertised bidding process, that must be reported. The, that is... That for me is, is the summary of the legislation that governs methods that aren't legislated. And these, these I think, are applicable to panels. Now, in South Africa, the most common type of panel, there are different types of panel, but the most common type of panel is what is termed a two-stage panel. I'm going to open up comments shortly a two-stage panel where there's a mini competition that uses quotations in that second stage. It's commonly used for services that are required on short notice, such as legal, plumbing, maintenance, etc. Bidders are appointed to the panel after an open competitive bidding process, use qualification criteria, functionality is often used as well. And then when the need arise, the panel members are invited to submit quotations, even if the value is above the normal quotation threshold, and then we would award. That's the typical common understanding. If you were to ask a procurement practitioner or professional or a bidder, what is a panel? That's what they might say it is. So in summary, we would invite through an open competitive tendering process, bidders to submit, they bid, we, we put them through a series of qualification um, and, and evaluation um, processes. We determine that they're acceptable. Those that are acceptable then get appointed to the panel. And then in the second stage, when the need arises, we run a little mini competition and then we appoint using the price score and the, and the sp specific goal score that um, Triple PFA use, as well as, of course, Objective Criteria 21F. So we run these little mini competitions, these mini, mini quotations during the second stage as and when we need it. Now, if we, we state now, that there is no legislation that has described what I've just explained to you. And if we comply with the rules that exist that I shared with you two slides ago around advertising, being clear on the procedures, making the final award on a 90, 10, 80, 20 basis, etc., then within that, why don't we look at panels differently and think about panels more in terms of the different types of frameworks that are out there? And I'm going to share with you now, and this is, this is the, the substance of this discussion today, different types of panels. And, and just stretch our minds a little bit and, and get us to think about other ways of thinking about panels using 
proven practices from around the world in other jurisdictions around the world and in South Africa, interestingly enough, on this. And the first one is that actually there can also be a one-stage panel. It doesn't have to always be a two-stage. There can be a one-stage panel. I'm not going to have time today to go through each of these. Happy to, to engage in any questions that you've got on some of these. But, but as we have around the world in frameworks, there are one-stage frameworks where there is not a second-stage quotation process, but it is still a panel. It's still a number of suppliers that are on the panel, but there is no second-stage quotation mini, mini competition process. Panel type one. Two, is the notion of closed or open panels. Fascinated to see that open panels are starting to make some leeway in South Africa's public procurement space. A closed panel is one where you run the public procurement process up front. The bidders get appointed to the panel for the three, four, five years, however the term might be. And no one else can join the panel after that point. It is effectively closed. What about an open panel? An open panel where bidders can join a panel after the initial close that happened in the initial formulation of the panel. As long as we're transparent, as long as we are clear on the procedures that will be followed, what about open panels? Haven't seen much of this happening, but uh, but certainly it is is starting to increase elsewhere in the world, even in Africa, and that is to have uh, electronic panels, where you you don't have this manual quotations process that we run. There's an electronic process that gets done in order to be appointed. Now, typically. In panels, the conditions are incomplete at the time that we establish the panel. When I say the conditions are incomplete, we've not yet established the price. That price very often comes later. But we can have a panel where the conditions are complete. There is no work that is required to establish the price. The price has been agreed. The only thing now is the as and when. Very interesting. It can be incomplete in terms of, of um, uh, functionality. That's another one that often comes up. Can we have functionality in the second stage? Yes, you see, you see when, when, when we put panels together, we must decide what we can agree, what conditions can be agreed in the first stage, what conditions can be deferred to the second stage, and if possible, can we have all those conditions agreed up front? Oh, this blows my mind. Can we have a panel with one supplier? I mean, right now, What's stopping us? What's stopping us having a panel with one supplier? What legislation says a panel must have more than one supplier? Many of you know, if you go out and you do a tender process and there's only one bidder that is acceptable, you don't stop the process and start the process again so that you've got three acceptable bidders, you have one bidder. You've followed an open competitive process to get to the point that you have one bidder. Why not use the mechanisms and the benefits of panels to allow you to appoint that one bidder without committing to a quantum or to a value during the period of that particular time? A framework and a transversal agreement is the same thing. A transversal agreement is a framework agreement. A transversal contract is a framework contract. The only difference is 
between a panel and a transversal agreement is that there are multiple buyers typically in a transversal agreement. Now, transversal agreements are governed by legislation, and the legislation does authorize certain institutions to embark on transversal agreements, which are government-wide agreements which can be used. But there's nothing stopping you putting a panel together with multiple buyers on it. If you're working in a particular location where there's only two or three particular public procurement buyers why not put one panel together that the three of you use? I'm not talking about piggybacking. I'm talking about putting a formal panel arrangement together where there are three buyers. Let's get effective in, in this. And of course, we can have single or multiple commodities or categories. There's a whole range of, of, of options on this. I, I did a, a case study recently where there is a, a panel. It's not called a panel. It's called an, an IDIQ in the U.S., for spacesuits. That's it. Nothing else. A single product is spacesuits. A fascinating project, which I'd uh, love to talk to more about on that. What about a mandatory or voluntary panel? Uh, if you set up a, a panel which is voluntary, which says, look, we're going to put this together, but we're, we're, we're not bound to always use the panel. We give ourselves the right as well that if 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 for under certain circumstances um it is not right for us to use the panel we might actually go outside of the panel and ask for the same products and goods and services why not third one is is any hybrid of any of these above types so maybe we have a a single supplier panel which is open we start with one supplier, but we give ourselves the ability to add more suppliers later. We could certainly um, include multiple options of this. We can have a two-stage panel that is open. Typically, you would not have a one-stage panel which is open. Uh, typically, it's uh, open panels always go with two-stage. There are different ways and combinations of these that we could we could do in order to get this done. Let me just quickly share with you Two, two other quick perspectives on this and then then uh, would welcome your, your comments as to what we've just gone through. As there's no legislation on panels, nor framework agreements in South Africa, there's no legislation on the duration of panels, be they closed or open. Now, the UN Central Law recommends a maximum duration. It's a very interesting concept that they've got in UN Central where they, they say you can, you can put a panel out there for, say, three years, but we have the option to extend this panel by another two years to the maximum duration of five. And, and there's, there's certain instances, if there's maybe a challenge on the panel where the panel might be suspended, that allows them to defer the start of that panel if it's been challenged in, in the middle of that uh, process, for example. Um, but to, you know, so that the three years can maybe push out, but the suspension doesn't doesn't allow them to go beyond the maximum five years, for example. Uh, UN Central talk about, uh, just generally, because it's a model law, they talk about a period of three to five years. CIDB, if you have a look at some of the, the framework contract material that CIDB have done, they also refer to three or five years. Uh, Europe, interestingly enough, at the moment has a four year on, on their frameworks, and the USA has a limit of five years, but very interesting, very, very, very interesting for me, is that they exclude ICT contracts from that limit of five years. Many of you know, if you if you commit to a particular architecture or technology, it's well beyond five years. So why put a contract ICT panel together and, and uh, be restricted to the five years? Very, very interesting. Now, I, I'm not going to have a chance to actually talk through, through open panels, but one of the fascinating aspects of open panels is we do not have necessarily limits on the duration of an open panel. Remember, one of the risks of panels is that the bidders start to learn and know about the other panel members, and there's a risk that they could start to collude. And hence, we want to try and limit the duration that panels are running for. 
with an open panel, we solve that problem. Very, very interesting. And interesting in the context of where we are now, folk. I'm not going to talk about this right now, but if the public procurement bill is signed off soon, when it becomes effective, the public procurement bill is going to have to regulate methods. There will have to be regulations on panels. I hope they call it frameworks rather or different types of framework agreements. Um, there has to be regulations on, on panels. I think you want to start thinking seriously now about putting some panels together, using some of the ideas that I've just shared with you here about designing the panel differently, different thinking about these panels, design them differently so that you've got a, a contracting, you've got arrangements you can use during the period where there might be some uncertainty that uh, might be imposed on us as a result of the uh, public procurement bill. Here's uh, just, just quickly uh, some conditions, and uh, I've been starting to think about what, um, what the different conditions might be used for, for different types of, of, um, of frameworks or different types of panels. Um, this, is, this is where there's no second stage competition. Um, you, you have a, a one stage panel and that's, that's where, and, and there is a, uh, a company we're working with at the moment where there is a one stage panel that, um, that we're on and it, um, and we were on and it is uh, very effective. It works very well, but, but the procurement need is very narrow. So it's not legal services. It's a very, very specific service that's required but it's an as and when requirement that uh, that's that's there. Where the quantity of the delivery location, where the, it's only really the quantity of delivery location that changes within the life of the panel. If, if there's a price adjustment mechanism which you can bring into it, that would be good for a one-stage panel. Um, and where there's not significant value that you can get from the second stage. You know, if, if, if there's a limited number of suppliers, maybe there's only one or two or three suppliers, and there's, there's not a lot of value in doing that second stage competition. Why have a second stage? And of course, um, if there are situations of extreme urgency or emergency, that might be another reason to have a one stage panel. There's some thoughts, everybody. I just wanted to, thought that I could, would share that with you and, um, and give you some thoughts on, on panels, thinking differently about panels to try and, and uh, overcome some of the the challenge that is, challenges that exist. I welcome any comments that you have. Any thoughts, anybody? Let's see if there's any hands that uh, that come up. If not, happy. Michael, always rely on you, Michael, to come up with something interesting. Hang on a sec, Michael. Hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. I just need to... Michael, you can go ahead and unmute. Then we'll go to Sinitemba and then Mogomo. Hi, Michael, welcome. Right. Yeah, <clears throat> right. At the moment, um, I think in South Africa, the maximum duration of framework contracts is three years. Um, I think that's a national treasury regulation. No. Um, um, uh, so, 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 sorry, Michael. There's no regulation, right? There are standards um, that have been established. Uh, there are directives that state three years, though. Okay, you okay. Know, be, be that Please. as it may. Well, that's fine, that's fine. <laughs> yeah. Okay, the, the problem at the moment with the way in which panels or framework agreements work out in South Africa is that you are locking in somebody for three years. Yeah. And by locking somebody in for three years, you're locking others out for three yeah. years. Yeah, yeah. So that's a closed panel. That's it. Um, when you have an open panel, and even with a closed panel, there is no verification that the original functionality still applies. Um, so I may have said I have the skill set to be on this panel, but when the chips are down and it comes to submitting my bid, um, there is no verification that since I submitted my application to be on the panel, circumstances have changed. Um, or I may even be in business, yeah. or I may even be able to effectively deliver the goods. And 
I, I was a consulting engineer in my previous life, and I can assure you that the amount of skullduggery that occurs on uh, panels in the consulting engineering industry is quite substantial. Um, people put bids in uh, saying they have expertise, which they don't have. Three years later, they shop around because they suddenly get an appointment. They're shopping around left, right, and center to find people who can deliver that. So yes, panels can be good. Open panels are probably better, but there has to be verification at the time of appointment or at the time in which bids are opened that whoever is invited to build to bid still is capable of delivering or has the skill sets that actually said they had. And if the in-house skill sets, they cannot be allowed to subcontract that work. Um, good, good, good points. Thanks, yeah, Michael. Agreed. And, yeah, just one other point on rotation. Ah, um, yes. Okay. Um, frequently, and it's, uh, there are a number of decided court cases, you find that the employer, who is the state in this case, refuses to appoint somebody because they, the argument or the allegation is that they have too much work or they have all the work. Now, there is no constitutional requirement uh, that states that anybody can be excluded from work because they have too much work. There is a requirement for the bid to be cost effective. And therefore, um, you can, once you've been through the functionality uh, um, stage, which is presumably what has already been done for you to be a member of the panel, the next uh, stage is decided only on price and preference and nothing else. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, and, and that's a caveat. There have been a number of, of state uh, uh, departments that have refused to appoint somebody because that they said they alleged they had too much work. And when it ended in court, the court just um, um, <clears throat> found in favor of those who challenged that yeah, sort of thing. Yeah, so, yes, yeah, open yeah. panels are great, but they need to be managed properly. Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. Uh, but I, I, I agree. I would be totally against a closed panel system. Yeah, uh, for South Africa, it's. Um, yeah. I, I, I think South Africa, we would um, be better served by open panels. Uh, Michael, I'm and just quickly sharing with you some work that I did just on some of the durations of some panels, and uh, you can see that um, there are certainly more. There are panels out there for five years. Um, I, th I think I think there's some work that's been done by CIDB on, and these are recent, by the way. These are not um, not old panels. I think there's a work that was done by CIDB where they may have mentioned that three might be better. Yeah, great points, Michael. Thank you. Let's jump to Senatemba. I see Lindiwe has raised her hand. Hi, Sen Senatemba, welcome. Uh, hi, Sean, how are you? Well, and you? I flew on this side. Apologies for my voice. <laughs> Shame, no problem. Okay. I, I just wanted to quickly contribute by saying on these panels, how we do it here uh, is that uh, when we advertise it, uh, even in the initial document, the PIT document, we indicate that uh, as much as it's, uh, the duration is for three years, but then we still uh, reserve the right to 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 re-advertise after the first after the expire of twelve months. Uh, oh, okay, okay, okay. So you fantastic. Yes, because for instance, in some of them, you'll find that a certain panel might require certain categories of skill set. Yes. And, and, and then you'll find that you have, maybe we're looking for finance, uh, you need for business advice. Absolutely. And then you need for training. And so, so you'll get certain categories where you would have two that are qualifying. And therefore, it, as much as you know that you must appoint them, but after 12 months, you must make sure that because you still need a variety of 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 bidders in that particular category, category as to ensure that at least there is proper work that is being done, and you get at least sufficient resources to ensure you can enroll all your programs effectively. 
<laughs> that's number one. That well, well, so, about. so, so, just just to be sure, then, uh, Sinatema, you you effectively have an open panel, which yes. you are opening every year on a periodic basis. You open that up and you bring more people on, and um, and you do that on on a on an. So, well done. Okay. okay, but how we interpret it is, is as follows: It's a closed panel. For the year. It's not a, yes, with a, with, it, it's, it's a mixture of both in the sense that where we have got all the sufficient skill set, then it's closed for three years. Okay, however, okay. So it's an option however, to open. Yes, however, even from the onset, we indicate that we reserve the right to do where that. Maybe a need might arise <laughs> or maybe there might be a change in the economy that would arise. Yeah. Yeah. As yeah. Then uh, bidders would not even those who had been uh, closed out are still welcome to bid after twelve months. Even if maybe we think that we want to still advertise the very same requirement, and also we, when we do that, we indicate that we, we do not change the conditions of this bid. If we if the re-advertisement or if the edition will be done within the initial three-year period. So it's not as if maybe when we want to enlarge the panel members, then we're going to change certain uh, uh, conditions. No, we will advertise, but then we'll be giving effect to that particular provision on the specification. Well done. That's well done, Senator Tamba. Yeah. Second, the second one uh, that I also agree with the previous speaker is the issue of the management of rotation. Because this one, it's, it's, I think it's one of those where, the, the, as you had also indicated in your presentation, it must be, the, the, the rotation must be on the document, on the PID document, and how it is going to be managed. So that even when the AG comes, then they can be able to test, to say the effectiveness of this control. Are you able to manage as indicated on the bid document, so that if then that is not the case, then there's a, there, there's an audit query to be responded to, uh, because this one is also if that is is not properly managed, it's a room for corruption. It's Absolutely. an end user would, would prefer uh, Sean Scott over Lindy, for instance. I'm just looking at the chat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now there will be, and most of them, when and we fight with them consistently by this, because they would say, no, but we know the, the, the professionalism and the services of Sean. So then uh, we want this to be done by, and we're saying, no, your document was not saying this. So then this is how you're going to implement the aspect. In the next panel, then maybe you will change the requirements. But in terms of this one, uh, then apply them accordingly. But it's a, it's a huge challenge that needs proper regulation, that also need proper monitoring. Uh, thank you very much, Sean. Very good. Thank you. Um, I, I've got, it's probably about a two-hour uh, training, um, some content on the different rotation methods. There's about seven there. There's another uh, method is not quite called rotation, it's called cascading. There's different techniques within that as well. And uh, certainly um, we 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 can certainly do much better in uh, how we rotate. Very often it's the rotation issues which cause many of the problems that we have with um, uh, with panels. Um, Lindiwe, Mogoma was on first. We'll do Mogoma and then we'll come to Lindiwe next. Hi, Mogoma. Mohoma. Mohoma. Thank you, Lindiwe. Hi, Mohoma. Mohoma, you've unmuted. We can't hear you. Let's jump to Lindiwe. And then if Mohoma does get her mic fixed up, then go ahead, Lindiwe. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. So, Sean, I just wanted to uh, to make two comments. The first one is around the screen that we currently have now. That uh, in our case, yes, we went out on an open and competitive RFQ to appoint a legal QA panel, and unfortunately, from the responses received, I only one was was compliant, and then 
we ended up having only that one supplier wow. for a duration of one year, yes, wow. uh, as, a, as a panel. And then this year, again, uh, we, we went on the same process again. We went out, out on an open competitive RFQ process to appoint technical legal QA technical a uh, uh, technical QA panel and legal QA, uh, QA panel so uh, like the other colleagues have mentioned we provision was made that as and when we like we reserve the right to go out on on RFQ again uh, with regard to those two uh, panels however i also want to say that uh, i think we have panels because of us as practitioners, it's, it's, it's convenient for us. Yeah. You know, you don't want to, yeah, we have them because of convenience. But then if you look at them from a economic transformation point of view, uh, they are actually That's disadvantaging true. to a certain extent, the new entrants into the market. Because if you have a, a, a can you imagine if we have a panel of cleaners of secure, or, or not, not, yeah, yeah. Maybe Treasury have a panel of security yeah. transversal yeah. contract on security companies. It means that the other security companies in, and, and transversal contracts, maybe they're mandatory that that time. So yeah. it means that only those 10, let's say for argument's sake, security companies will be able to do business with government for three or five years. So what about the other uh, new entrants into the market? So my view is that, yes, they are convenient for us as practitioners, but we we need to look at the nature of the commodity first before we can decide on the on the panel. Surely, if there are a lot of role players in the industry, I wouldn't advise that we we have panels. But those commodities that maybe it's a it's a niche market, they are a very 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 few, and you know you don't want to go out on RFQ now and then. Then you can have a a a panel. But my view is that as practitioners, we must a try and balance, you know, the the convenience vis-a-vis -vis a opportunity to allow the new entrants to participate into the economic market. Thank you, Sean. Thanks, Ndube. So you have, if I was to use the slide here, you have a single stage, single supplier, open panel. Sorry, I was on mute. Yes, that's correct. That's correct. Eh? Very yes, fascinating. Thank you. Well done. Yes. Uh, Ladiba, but you you, you will also remember the time when we remember before CSD, we used to yeah. have um, our our list of suppliers. And and remember, there were there were particular rules with that. One rule was that somebody could join at any point. Yes. Yes, and I and do. the other yes. one was that we had to, at least on a quarterly basis, we had to we had to maintain, yeah. and then every year we had to run out and do your know, refresh that list. And um, yeah, you know, we we've forgotten about those principles with panels. And yeah. so great to hear that you you've got this open concept because, as Michael said, that lockout um, or lock in. Um, it's not it's not necessarily right for our economy. Thank you, Lindy. Yes, I agree with him. Thank you, Sean. Good one. Mohoma, anything? If not, let's go to Felicia. Mohoma, let's hear. No, I can't hear, Mohoma. Let's jump to Felicia. Let's jump to France. Hi, France. Welcome. Felicia. Hello. Yes. Hello, colleagues. Yes. Uh, Hi. Who is that? Who is that? Is that France? It's, it's France. Yeah. I was well, scheduling to open up this. Welcome, yeah. France. Yeah. The scenario that I want to paint here is uh, in the case that we, we never advertise or put on the bid document the rotation method mm. as we were mm. uh, doing the panel, mm. what would be the other alternative method to communicate to the bidders or the suppliers in terms of the rotation? Because my belief here is that, or oh, I'm thinking that if we put it in an SLA, after we have done the tender to say, this is how rotation will unfold, will that be 
uh, fault or or will it be acceptable? I just want to have clarity on that. And the second one, we have instances where we have established a panel with prices that are fixed, like we have predetermined the prices for the bidders. And, and when coming to issues of maybe selecting uh, suppliers from that panel, you find that it's difficult because the prices are fixed and we can't just do it on the issue of the 80 part, the 20 part in terms of preferential a split of 80 20. So maybe I would want to get another <laughs> advice on that. <laughs> Thank uh, you. Fraud, so what you've just explained are, are typical errors and um, mm. their challenges. France, um, look, I, th this is just Sean, all right? This is, uh, I, I'm not giving you a legal opinion or uh, an audit view. Um, but the, the first thing is that this happens frequently. I'm not aware of findings where the AG has said you didn't disclose, uh, and people can can share with us now. You didn't disclose the rotation method in your in your bid documents, and therefore this is irregular. I'm not aware of anything like that. I think there's a risk of that happening at some point in time, as soon as um, um, you know, the AG gets on top of that kind of thing. So, um. Having a process where you discuss with the bidders the rotation mechanism through the SLA is probably the next best thing to do. Be, be aware, though, that as a supplier, if you were to do that and tell me that, for example, um, that your rotation method is going to use be alphabetical, and my company starts with W, which it does, then I will be very upset that your rotation mechanism uh, is going to be alphabetical and, and my, my company name is with a W. So you, know, you, you will expect to get some challenges through that process, but um, uh, it's probably the next best thing to do is, uh, is to do that. There's nothing wrong with, with uh, negotiating that type of thing with the bidders at that point. Uh, as long as as long as they all feel that you're being fair um, during that process, um, your second one around the fixed look. Uh, the, the the fixed prices, um, those kinds of things you need to factor into your procedures early on. Remember. Um, the the preferential procurement regulation says you must award to the one that scores the highest points for price and specific goals. You, you must award, so you've got to find a way of of um, uh, bringing that into the process somehow. Uh, either it is in in um, your rotation sequence. Or, or some other way, but you've got to find a way of fixing that. It's it's very difficult that you fix the prices up front in the panel. Uh, and 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 I don't know, France, it has added complexity if the prices are fixed, but they're not the same, right? So there's some panels where they would negotiate a fixed fee with the bidders, or they would just tell the bidders, this is the set fee, and, and therefore the price is all the same, and and then, um, but but when you've got fixed prices that are different, it becomes even more difficult to to manage that. So probably um, you know take the experience that you've got in putting that together and see if there isn't a different way of um, putting that panel together because it, it it probably is at risk of having some findings if you continue with it. Let's let's go to Lucky and if um, Mohoma or Felicia Felicia, if you can unmute at any point, you're welcome to. Let's Felicia. I'm here, Chair. Ah, oh, there we are. Hi, Sean. My name is Sean. Welcome. Oh, sure, sure, Sean. It's Mohoma. I've just joined with my Mohoma. Welcome. I'm struggling with the for, with the laptop here. No uh, mine is just. Uh, I just want to just start by saying thank you because uh, with the, for this presentation. 
Uh, we recently had a bid that we evaluated in the department and then only one service provider was appointed. Yeah. But uh, based on what you indicated that there is no law that says we cannot appoint one, I think it answers the questions that were raised. But now, uh, the, the the issue that I have now, uh, maybe this is just a request for clarity. Sure. Uh, I've, I've only had the privilege of working in two departments in my entire life up to today. And in the previous department, we used to create panels, but the panels were, it was only, we were only evaluating them on functionality. Yes. And the price will come afterwards. Second stage. Uh, when, when there is specific jobs, that's what we would do. Yes. But now my, in my current department, it, it's a different ball game, which I, you know, to date, I'm still trying to um, make understanding of it, whereby you have a panel, you, you, you're sourcing for panel, then you advertise and, and, and with DPSA rates or IRBA rates and so on. But then it gets to a point whereby after we evaluate the functionality, we still then go and evaluate them on price and uh, BEE or price and specific goals. And then to me is like how do we do how the how do we factor that in because now uh, it goes gets to a point whereby uh, bidders must actually give the rates for the different of uh, what do you call mm. the different mm. uh, participant or what do you call a team mm. project team mm. and then from then they must give a total of fourteen thousand and then it will come back to say uh, this person is evaluated on price and uh, BEE or price and specific goals uh, with 14,000. This price is only used for evaluation purposes. So I still try, I'm trying to get understanding. I don't know if there is any law that guides that. Can we really evaluate a, a panel on a price before we even have the actual work being done? Or should that be done at the second stage of the process? Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mahoma, there, there's there's no regulation or legislation on this point. So you've you've just got to apply the principles that we've got in the Constitution of fair, equitable, transparent, and competitive, cost effective, and in accordance with your public, your preferential procurement policy. Um, and and the Paja principles of of uh, lawful, re reasonable, and procedurally fair. So those those principles you've got to apply in coming coming up with this. Now, there's nothing wrong with doing a some form of price and specific goals work in the first stage. One one benefit of doing that is it it might inform your cascading so for example what cascading is is um is you use you use such as the price and specific goals formula to determine the relative ranking of the bidders all right and let's say um uh, the the one bidder has a low price and a good good uh, uh, specific goal score and it, it scores like 90 and you've got number two that maybe scores a total of 80 and and um, number three that maybe scores a total of of 60 or something like that you know th but they're all go through onto the panel the cascading approach says that um what we'll do is we'll try and allocate proportional to the bidders work that that's proportional to their scoring and so you could use that scoring to help with that second stage allocation process. I don't know if that makes sense, Mahomo, but that's that's one way to use it. So there's nothing wrong in in you, you know no one can say you can't do it, but it, it, that was one of my points I made up front. Very often it happens, and then the question is, well, why did we do that? Why did we ask for the prices when we're still going to have a second stage quotation process? So, um, you know. It, these these panels need to be designed. That's the point of of showing this this to you is we've got to design these panels from the start properly and figure out what type of panel, what type of rotation mechanism we're going to use. How can we answer these questions on the 80, 20, 80, 20 90, 10 uh, points that that come up? We've got it. We've got to design those up front. And too often. 
we, we're getting into a, well, we'll go out on panel, we'll offer some prices, we get out there, we'll put them on, and then we'll ask the quotations, and we haven't thought through this properly. And that, that if there's anything from today's discussion is, please, let's, uh, let's be more deliberate about designing these, these panels going forward. Felicia? Okay, let's, uh, let's jump to Lucky, and then we'll go to Andres, and then we'll go back to Michael. Hi, Lucky. Uh, thank you, Sean, and good morning, Welcome. everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Okay. Uh, firstly, I would like to find out if you could uh, please share the presentation with us. Certainly. All right. Uh, then secondly, I do have a question around the panels. Uh, my question is, uh, should a panel bid include uh, the specific goals? Uh, or should it only be evaluated and, and awarded based on uh, functionality only? A great question, Lucky. So you've got to you've got to decide that based on the type of panel that is appropriate for that commodity. That was that was Lindiwe's question. Okay, if it's a very um, a kind of narrow commodity, then then you could certainly go for something which might be a one stage. Um, as uh, you know, single or two, two bidder type, you, you can do that. So de design for the commodity that you got, design the panel to, panel to suit that commodity, number one. Number two, um, decide how you're going to rotate. If you're definitely going to have multiple suppliers on the panel, decide your rotation mechanism. If, if you're going to have maybe a, um, a ceiling price or a fixed fee for the activity for the unit, um, then then you might want to bring specific goals in upfront to decide the ranking and the rotation method. You can bring that into that first stage, but understand why you're going to do that. And typically, lucky it would be, in my view, to help inform your rotation mechanism. The, the, there's two points to rotation. One is is the mechanism that you're going to rotate. But the first one you've got to think about is what is the starting sequence? Right? Who are you going to go to first? Okay. And so if you bring in specific goals, for example, into that, maybe the highest scoring specific goals, but is the one that goes first. Yeah. Does that make sense, Lucky? It does, but okay. what I wanted to know is yeah. that uh, uh, during the second stage, uh, if the approach that you will apply is a quotation basis, yes, do you have to include the specific goals in the uh, in the initial original bid, or specific goals should be only included when you have specific uh, the, the, jobs or uh, during the second stage? It, it, it completely depends. Uh, you can still have it in the beginning to inform the rotation mechanism, rotation process in the first stage. Um, but as far as our pre preferential procurement regulations are concerned right now, you also have to bring it into the second stage. I hope oh, I've answered your question. So, okay. So typically it can come, come into, um, you use it in the first stage to help you understand the, um, the rotation mechanism that you're going to use to inform the rotation mechanism. And... Um, all right. All right. But you so still you have, have to, to keep. Go, go ahead. All right. So uh, if the initial bid had uh, a specific goals, then when you do the quotation on the uh, panel members, yeah, do you have to keep the same specific goals that was included in the original bid? Ah, or you great, can great question. Uh, you can change that. There's nothing at the moment that would change that. And um, and the only thing you've got to do, that's a great, 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 great question. The only thing you've got to do is you've got to be clear up front mm. that there are some conditions that will st stay in both the first and the second stage, and some will change. And as long as you, you let them know in, in the initial procurement documents that the specific goals – for this and this and this might change in the second stage, you can do that. There's nothing stopping you doing that. Now, it's just like, like you can actually have 
uh, and there's there's precedence out there globally. You can have functionality in the first stage and functionality in the second stage. And you can even in the second stage, you can change the weighting of the functionality in the second stage. Oh, okay. All right. Um, what 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 is recommended, and this might help you with with your point, Lucky, is what is recommended is if you if you do design a um, a panel that allows you to change weighting for functionality in the second stage, that it is often better to advertise in your tender document the range of the change. Yeah. All right. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. So and then, then it becomes button. it, it uh, absolutely will will do. Let's let's a uh, good one. Let's jump to Andres and then we'll go back to Michael. Hi, Andres. Welcome all the way from the Eastern Cape. Good morning. Good morning. Yes. Yeah, so, so, sorry for joining a bit late as usual. No problem. Um, the, the um the the I've got three statements I'd like to make to um and firstly. Just a bit more general is the use of panels is an absolute minefield. I think the um, the the items that's already been discussed just points that out. And yeah. um, uh, as much as people see value in it, sometimes the value is is disguised uh, manipulation. Yeah. I'm just going to yeah. use that terminology. Yeah. So that's the first point. The second point, I just want to talk about the issue of of rotation and and maybe just a bit of practical advice. Um, uh, we we do uh, have some transversal tenders in the province, so um, that's always where we get stuck. Yeah, is about rotation and and one of the arguments that when you start talking about rotation and introduce it as part of your bid award strategy. Then, um, because now, obviously, as a committee, as the the, the committee that uh, I, I chair, the the bit adjudication committee for transversal contracts, and um, we're concerned that we leave the door open for subjective selection mm. of suppliers by mm. the officials or the departments mm. to the point that again manipulation comes into the mm. equation. Mm. Um, so, so, and then the debate comes up saying, but is it legal now to add a rotation policy that you never advertised? Mm. Um, might, as you've mentioned, might that not trigger audit findings? And our argument, why we say it's not a problem, and there's a strong argument as well, why you cannot necessarily dictate it at the point of advertisement. Um, it's not a problem because you are technically negotiating with the winner, winning bidders at the point of award. So introducing new terms does not imply that yeah. you have undermined the 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 um, the uh, uh, the, the rights of process, other bidders. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yes. So so and and you you quite correctly stated that the, the pillars of procurement is ultimately the test of if a panel is working. For instance, one example is we we dealt with a scenario, and I heard the example given as well, where that department advertised for a panel and ended up getting one um uh functional bidder. Mm. And we said, no, you actually failed to achieve what you set out to do. Because you you set out to create a panel for a reason, mm. and that reason is possibly for um, uh, a, 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 an, an, um, a risk management uh, and and not have a one takes all kind of scenario for risk management purpose. And if you're not achieving your initial goals of your bid, then your bid is basically failed. You have to cancel it and start over. Sorry to say that. Mm, so mm. so there's no such thing as a, a one member panel but because <laughs> yeah. you haven't done what you set out to do so just be careful of that particular scenario. yes 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 um then then the final statement i want to make or the third statement uh, and I've, I've i have a lecture that i give on bed rigging and unfortunately in the panel space the risk of bed reading becomes extremely high. Yeah. Meaning that 
the the bidders that has been awarded in the panel becomes aware of each other. Yeah. So now they and in a, in a, especially in a two state bids scenario, those bidders can play the department like a fiddle. Yeah. Because they can get together and say, right guys, let's say, uh, let's rotate it according to our terms <laughs> and yeah. not according to the department's terms. And and they can do cover quoting, they can do all kinds of illegal activities. So panels in that sense is also a problem. Oh, and I, I just just reminded, but like I said, there's a the old bit reading story is a is a long story. I'm not gonna go into it. I just want to raise everybody's attention that yeah. there is a yeah. major yeah. risk there. Yeah. Um, and then the last issue I wanted to talk about is um and again practical experience this is not stuff we 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 think up ourselves it's real life scenarios we presented with where the, and um this is a human settlement scenario where they also had a panel and then um they they have a two stage process so they have an initial stage that brings you onto the panel and the second stage to to um basically award a particular project the problem is is the second stage demands the same amount of effort it would have taken oh. to go out on a public um uh bit. Yeah. But now you have this element of eliminating people that that's not on the panel because they even went so far because of fear of of the AG yeah. um, finding them wanting that they want to advertise the the bit on the the public platforms, but it's actually now a panel. So they want to demonstrate that everybody in the panel had the opportunity <laughs> to respond. And in the process, they've got all these people responding that's not on the panel. And oh, yeah. Not on the panel. The, the, the advertisements clearly state you have to be on the panel. Yeah, yeah. It's it's an absolute mess. Yeah. So um, uh, my, my view is, again, um, think long and hard before you consider going down the road of panels because our recommendation at the end of the day is, is you actually by creating a panel you're actually undermining the 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 procurement principle of being equitable you undermine the the procurement principle of being competitive because you're limiting the number of quotations you're getting so um uh one would need to be extremely careful when going down that road because the, the, the in in theory it sounds like you're going to save time but in reality it takes you exactly they, they the same are, time mm. <clears throat> and that and at mm. the same time you you actually possibly even undermining your own objectives thank you just has, has a question for you andres yes. uh where where um, hopefully going to be going into a new legislative regime soon. And we know that the public procurement bill as it stands says that um, methods must be legislated, must be regulated. Okay, need, need to. So do you think that if we were able to effectively legislate panels, that we would do away with a lot of the problems we currently have? I do think some guidance would be necessary, but mm. um, at the same time, um, our biggest problem is um, I don't think we 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 don't have a shortage of rules. Uh, uh, mm. the, the, okay. The, okay. The, 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 yeah. I I I'm almost tempted to say, remember that um, uh, 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 we might have still be 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 living in the Garden of Eden, Eden if it wasn't for that one rule. <laughs> so I I, so I, I hear you. Um, <laughs> it's it's always the rule that makes you makes you become non-compliant, and and unfortunately, yes, yes. the knee-jerk reaction of government is when there is non-compliance, we come back with more rules. Yeah, it just creates yeah, more non-compliance. Yeah, yeah. So and, um, you never achieve your outcome. What we let me give you the right answer. The right answer is is this stuff works, and in the hands of competent professional contract managers that knows how to run them. Um, so you do get good examples. Mm. Um, <clears throat> we, uh, a, a long time ago, 
we at the Universal Service and Access Agency of South Africa, we had a panel of what we refer to as primary and secondary contractors. And um, we were, our rotation policy was based on um, um, a performance. Mm. So if you, if you, the tasks that's given to you, if you mm. are the first one who's finished with this task, becomes eligible for the for the, the next being one. assigned mm. the next next mm. one. Mm. So um, that created some form of incentive mm. for them to perform, and at the same time, we also had this secondary panel within the panel, which we called secondary supplies, which was mm. basically mm. SMMEs that was was given a percentage of the work, but they were project ma managed by the primary, the primary. Contractors mm. who has to sign off on their work. And again, mm. um, um, it, it created a self-policing environment that, that sort of made sure that standards are, are maintained and that the big guy is busy teaching the small guy. So there's amazing things you can pull off with panels, but it, it requires an element of professional, pro, let's call it project management and contract management, that if your organization do not have that people in place, a panel becomes a freight train out of control <laughs> in some instances. Thanks, Andres. Thank you. Good one. Thank you. Uh, Michael, I did say we'd come to you. I'm keen to also hear from Hamotso. Go ahead, Michael. Was that a legacy hand? No, sorry. Um, just a couple of points. Bid yeah. rigging. Um, yes. If the, dis if the disincentive is large enough, um, yes, I think bid rigging can be overcome. But uh, <clears throat> bid rigging normally happens because things are not properly managed. Yeah, yeah. Um, just one point on the criteria. You can add more criteria, but you cannot remove the original criteria. In other words, because you've submitted a bid or you you put a tender advert out with 10 criteria and all of a sudden you have uh, eight bidders and none of them meet those 10 criteria you can't start removing uh, criteria at at lib you have to start from scratch again but you can add more at a later stage um one of my pet subjects is for goodness sake you know, we talk about transparency. Let's be transparent about these things because that's been the biggest downfall of procurement, the lack of transparency. Um, let's publish, you've got a panel, you have a panel of whatever, contractors, service providers, publish the names. If they had to uh, meet 10 criteria to be on the panel, publish the 10 criteria and publish the results. It doesn't matter if they all know each other. It actually probably increases competition. I don't buy the fact that it decreases competition because, and publish how many times one, one of them is actually appointed to do work because all the others will start asking themselves, why is company <laughs> A doing all the work? You know, what are we doing yeah, wrong yeah, that yeah, they are doing yeah. right? And all of a sudden the competition increases. Sure, there is a risk of, of bid rigging, but that risk you can overcome with heavy fines and heavy penalties. If you're caught, uh, you know, then you're out for 10 years. And that's, that's the end of it. And then the last thing is make updating of these panels a condition of bid and take that responsibility away from the state entity and put that in the hands of those who are on the panels. And again, Heavy sanctions. If you don't update your uh, membership when things change or when one of those criteria changes, you're out and you're out for 10 years. Something like that. Th yeah. 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 Then all of a sudden, these things start falling into place. Yeah. And yeah. I mean, as the, the previous speaker was saying, you can do unbelievable things with panels. Yeah. Um, Good one. You know, yeah. Okay. That's Thanks, it. Michael. Thank you. Appreciate it. Komotso. Uh, do my land at this court. How are you doing, uh, sir? I'm good, thanks. How are you? Very good, uh, greetings you. to the other uh, colleagues who are attending. Uh, Mr. Scott, there is just a few points that I wanted to make, and I had Michael uh, touched on the others that I wanted to talk about. 
uh, while you were presenting, you did indicate that there is no proper mechanism or legislation or regulation that is in place to guide us on how are we going to rotate our closed panel. Yes. And then with, without such a mechanism in place, it's seriously uh, questionable how such a rotation is being done by us as practitioners yeah. and therefore leaves us uh, leaves the institution or the department vulnerable for litigations. Yeah. Yeah. The other issue, if if we are not using that rotation and we are inviting bids, let's say maybe my panel is, has only five members and I'm inviting bids from them whenever I have to appoint, uh, there is an opportunity or a possibility of them to uh, for collusive bidding. You understand? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. And then the, and and then with them being limited like that. It also leaves uh, uh, open up an exploration of, of my integrity as a practitioner, because if they are five and we have advertised that uh, we have got five service providers on our panel, and then uh, now uh, I'm about to be to be issuing works out, and the works are supposed to be coming out because they most definitely do, do be knowing who are the practitioners mm -hmm. at a particular institution. They can come. Uh, question my integrity or challenge my integrity with, uh, you know, the banana slips, the brown envelopes. And then my integrity becomes, starts, starts to be at stake, you understand, yeah. because of that, yeah. that issues of the panel. Yeah. So yeah. the panels are a very, very, very big uh, 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 challenge that we are, we are facing. And then the other one that you did mention was the one that even if you are evaluating for a panel and it's only one bidder who succeeds, it does not longer serve the purpose that we, we are trying to establish of sharing work amongst uh, service providers. It is now a one person's one person show. You understand? Mm -hmm. That is mm -hmm. my two cent take for the day. Thank you, Sean. Right. Thank you. And remember, on your last point, though, Komotso, is may, that's not always the purpose, right? Is to share. The purpose might be to contract in capacity on an as and when required basis. Uh, and yes, so, yes, 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 so yes. yeah, without necessarily committing to a quantum of work or a value to a particular bidder, so um, uh, it depends on the purpose, depends on the commodity, it depends on why we want the panel. But uh, but you're right; it's um, uh, certainly if we go out there and it's a very generic product, and we want to have an opportunity to rotate work amongst a, a range of bidders, and we and and we only get the one, we're defeating the purpose. You're right. Good one. Let's uh, check if um, Felicia's been able to sort out her mic. If not, we'll jump to... Go ahead, Felicia. Good morning, colleagues. Morning, we can hear you. Now. We can hear you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I need assistance in terms of the, um, the panel setup. We recently, actually lately, we had advertised, we want to advertise a panel of medical practitioners. Yes. The problem is that previously we were faced with a lot of litigations in terms of all the issues that we have raised in terms of the management of the panels, the rotations, yes. uh, the controls that we put in place at some point, the, uh, the suppliers within the panels are fighting and it, it's, it becomes a problem. Now we, we we also recently also had a challenge in terms of we will have a panel of medical practitioners who say that they will be testing certain uh, sicknesses within the officials within the department. Now, while the panel is running, there's another variant which is not part of that particular contract. Now it becomes a challenge in terms of now, do we then include that in the panel or do we go outside the panel? If we go outside the panel, the panelists will then start fighting to say, but you do have a panel of medical practitioners. Why then do you go out? The last one that I need also need assistance is that we also kind of resolve, resolve to say, now let's go to a panel where we are not going to include uh, prices uh, and quantities because sometimes they are known. But the challenge is that we don't want to have a panel of 100 suppliers. We want to limit it maybe to 10 or to 20 suppliers per province or per area or per district. Yeah. Now, how then do we then reach that deadlock to say these are the 10 that we're going with without having a prize or a specific goals as a, a determining factor in terms of that? Um, thank you. Let's talk about your last question first. Um, so... There, there are different ways to do the maximum. One is uh, you've got to be clear and tell everybody up front that there will be a maximum. 
Um, one way to achieve that is to recognize that we don't have to use the minimum quality, uh, minimum uh, score for functionality any longer when deciding whether your, in your case, your medical practitioner is qualified to be put on the panel. Um, we don't have to do that anymore. That was a requirement that we had with um, the 2017 regulations, but that doesn't exist in the preferential procurement regulations 2022. So one of the ways uh, to achieve that, which is very effective for panels, is to think about um, the functional scoring being a top five or top 10, if you want to have a maximum of 10 suppliers, to say, we're going to take the top 10 scoring functional medical practitioners, and those are the ones that, that are going to go onto the panel. If you're worried about um, you know, uh, that being disadvantageous to maybe medical practitioners in rural areas or whatever the, the reason might be, you can certainly use a, a top eight with a two being at your discretion. There are different ways of doing that. So, so there are different ways to achieve that, that maximum, and you can certainly do that. Um, you can also, by the way, just include in your panel up front that there will be a minimum, and you can state up front that we will only get this panel going if there are a minimum of three. So you can you can do those things, but the principle is you need to be transparent and disclose that up front in terms of how you get that done. So that's that's one way to do it. As long as you've got some way of fairly and in a transparent manner telling the bidders this is how you're going to choose the 10, you can you can do that and um, get that done. The other point that you raised, um, you're going to have to remind me again, I, I should have taken notes. Um, I, I can remind you as to having a variant that was not included. Ah, yes, in the yes. Yes. Uh, so, so, um, this is this is remember one of the one of the things that I mentioned is you can have very narrow, you can have very wide range of commodities or services, as long as you've given yourself the ability to um, describe that range of services clearly up front in the panel. You know, I, I imagine you're not going to, on your medical panel, um, ask them to wash the dishes and do cooking. It's going to be related to the professional, to the profession that they're in and to the work that they're doing. And as long as you clear on that and you give yourself the ability to include those kinds of things up front, I don't see any, any issue with that. Um, as long as it's done up front and you give yourself the ability to do that. In, in some discussions I had recently, we were going through that. We were actually saying, you know, these are the services. However, we will also, um, you know, depending on requirements, we might add this range of services to the panel should there be a need to. And as long as that was clear, then then um, you should be fine. But be very careful about, about um, um, adding things to a panel which were not which were not where you you don't have a provision in your upfront documentation for doing that. Um, your your you ha, you raised a point about pricing. Um, Alicia, do you want to come back in again and just from there was some other point. Pricing was uh, in in a sense that we didn't want to include pricing when we're doing the one of the maximum and the minimum. So how then do we then um, reach a dot lock in terms of the maximum that we want to reach? How then do we select to say, yes, you've uh, met the, the minimum requirements in terms of the functionality of 75. Yes. Then we have 30 with 75. How do I then get to the 10 that I want as per the terms of reference that we've advertised to say our maximum is 10, uh, but yeah, I did yeah, yeah. bring um, the maximum. It's too late. Yeah. It's too late. If you've already advertised and you've used the minimum qualifying score for functionality, you can't. Uh, you can't do that. They, uh, yeah, I, um, difficult to. Uh, it's, it's difficult. Um, 
I would, I would, if, if your panel is still going, I would rather change that somehow. Um, this is the difficulty with the minimum. And um, I had this discussion with, with Treasury is um, that minimum qualifying score for functionality is not necessarily working and it doesn't always work for, for panels. Um, so that's unfortunate. Um, I'm not too sure how you're going to solve that point, um, Alicia. Maybe maybe Andres has got some suggestions. He may want to be making another point. I saw you took your hand down yeah, and you yeah. put it back up yeah. again. Go ahead, no, Andres. No, no. I, I actually I want to respond to something Michael said, but um, also just on this particular one of Felicia, um, it is a tricky affair. Yeah. Technically speaking, you have the fifteen or twenty percent of variation to play with. So if if you're gonna make an a slight change in the service offering within a given appointment, as you've already mentioned, as long as it's in the broad category of service and you want to maybe add an, an specialized service in a certain area, as long as it's not material and it is yeah. literally yeah. tweaking. And again, I, I use my argument of saying, if you select it based on certain minimum criteria and that additional service is not part of that minimum criteria, it wasn't an elimination criteria per se, then it's something that I call it negotiating with the winning bidder. Mm. Nothing wrong mm. with it. It's mm. allowed mm. within the context mm. of PFMA. Mm. Maybe just a reference to Michael's comment. We specifically mentioned that you can add criteria, but you can't remove criteria. Um, I'm, that's, let's call it, the nice. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I hear you. Yeah. Ch changing criteria is always a dangerous game. Yeah, um, yeah. One of our famous um, uh, court cases, the all pay case involving Sasa and uh, yes, and uh, um, where they added uh, uh, um, retina scanning as a criteria and eliminated all pay in the process, only had thumbprints or fingerprints. Um, and <clears throat> the judgment of the court were very profound that it says, regardless of the outcome of the tender, um, uh, if you made a mistake during the evaluation process, that cannot be overlooked. And um, and that was why the Constitution... We, we lost you there, Andres. I mean, yeah. Just got away from everybody. But... Um, uh, the other point I want to make just on the whole issue of criteria is we must distinguish between, and I'm bringing back the old argument of the, the award strategy or rotation strategy, we must distinguish between evaluation criteria and terms and conditions. So terms and conditions, uh, the classic one we all know is like payment terms, um, which is anyway set by law at uh, 30 days. Mm. Although Contractually, you can agree different approaches to do sure, how you commercially, sure, 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 sure. commercially execute the contract. And that, that in my view, and we get very confused. We, we've got these, and sorry for, for maybe uh, patronizing anybody that, that's got a stronger view on this, but we've got these confusing terms that we call um, um, uh, terms and conditions and then special terms or, and conditions. Special conditions. Mm. And special, yeah. Mm. And and really, it means the same thing. <laughs> it's And we, we get all wound up in definitions, but the simple short and long of it is is anything that that does not impact your selection criteria can be added as a as I call it, a negotiated term to the contract, especially, and, and one of the famous court cases where this was very well coined was the um, um, the Simonier case, where the judge specifically says, we cannot upfront when we're planning a tender, um, um, and the, the argument there was specifically about objective criteria, and it maybe even touches on Felicia's question mm -hmm. on, on mm -hmm. how do you select between hundred respondents and your criteria ended up qualifying all hundred. So how do I now narrow it down to 50 or 20? And the argument is objective criteria. That objective criteria is captured in the triple PFA 
and two one f and, and it and and it was was tested in court cases and as I said the Simonier case was a good example Simonier versus Lovemore College love love and Dale uh, love Dale love Dale, yeah love yeah Dale. okay anyway they, it's a lot of love um and the the long story short there was the judge specifically used the terminology that you cannot envisage all the variants of responses that you can get you can't see into the future how this thing is going to materialize you think you've put down enough criteria and specified enough criteria to make a, a narrow the field to your liking just to find it didn't do the job and the test remains objectivity and and maybe just as a final parting shot on what objectivity is objectivity is tested by courts where it says where two objective independent parties can come to the same conclusion using that criteria so objectivity is the test of objectivity is that it's consistent in its application so again understand how objectivity work and you can use objective criteria which you introduce after the fact to your to your bit mm. to narrow the field um because you will be in a position to defend it in a court of law. And that's all, that's the the the, the real test of of the, the term, if I can use that term. Okay. Thanks. I Thanks, Andres. That in. Thanks. Thanks. I, I have not come to grips with the use of objective criteria before the price and specific goals calculation. And I must maybe just think through that. I think it's an interesting interesting perspective um i think the same simeon a lovedale case said that um it's got to be objective in the sense that it's not determined by someone's opinion i think that's also something nice in that but well that's that's the subjectivity of that's the, that, exactly that, that yeah. creeps in yeah um yeah. Good one, good one. And uh, for anyone who's not quite clear on that, maybe we should run a objective criteria discussion again one day because um, uh, it's something that that we really didn't didn't um, focus on a lot under 2011 and 2017 in particular. And uh, it's a very very powerful and important mechanism in um, the triple PFA. Pabalo, welcome. Hi Sean. Hi everyone. Hi. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, everyone. Uh, Sean, I, uh, uh, am I hearing that um, if, if the uh, evaluation criteria has been set with a hell rate, uh, anyone that makes the hell rate uh, is supposed to be enlisted? And uh, the, uh, uh, the it, 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 would it be an acceptable practice to say is Say if hundred make it, but uh, as you know that look uh, as say can I say that the first uh, attend uh, 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 in accordance to uh, the scoring of 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 the functional criteria are the ones that are going to be enlisted and considered or uh, or, uh, or as for as long as they they make the hell rate even if it's hundred then uh, they have to be enlisted. What 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 is the acceptable practice? Uh, so so uh, great great question, Pablo. At the moment, there's no legislation. So let's just be sure that we understand that, okay? The the Preferential Procurement Regulation 2017 said they're acceptable if they meet the minimum qualifying score for functionality. So that's no longer there. Now, if, if we agree that that legislation doesn't exist right now and that we have other options, then we must look at what are the other options options which are acceptable in the public procurement space. And one of those, um, and, and I know it's in use in South Africa already, is that we take the top scoring bidders for functionality. Now, what's got to be clear is that we've got to tell the bidders up front that this is how you will, this is, this is what we will use to decide whether you're an acceptable bid or not is we're going to take the top scoring bidders for functionality because that changes the game. It means now that a bidder um, will have to give their all in terms of a good proposal, which will give them a high score. At the moment, there's no incentive for a bidder to do that. 
So all they've got to do is they've just got to meet that hurdle rate, as you say. Um, so as long as it's stated up front, then that that is acceptable. There are other acceptable mechanisms for doing that. The top scoring bidder is one of those. I mean, there there is there there's an institution in South Africa that um, in some of the bids they don't even look at the top five scoring bidders. They just take the top scoring bidder on functionality. Very interesting. I mean, so there isn't legislation right now that uh, that restricts us, and as long as we're uh, we are clear up front on how it is that we're going to decide what is acceptable or not. We could use other mechanisms, and there there are other ways we can we can certainly unpack that uh, those different options again one day if we need to. And Kelly, last person, and Kelly, welcome, Maleka. Hi, thank you so much, Sean. I just want to get clarity with regard to dealing with the contract period of the appointing panels. Say, for ah, example, yes. we appoint, we are, I'm currently sitting in an evaluation committee where we are appointing a panel of service providers. And say, for example, we come up with two or less than five service providers and the committee feels like they want to add more service providers. Obviously, the current one will be appointed uh, for a certain period which will start, for example, from the 1st of August. And when we want to add, we'll go again on an open tender to advertise for additionals. So the new one, maybe, for example, it will be concluded next year, March. Yeah. So how do we align the two contracts? Because it's one um, panel and the other one started in August this year and the other one is going to start March next year. So do we say each one has its own 36 months or we align the second one to the first one? What what did you do? What did you do in um uh in your procurement documentation on the first one? Did you say that it would be 36 months with an option to go out more regularly, or, or was it silent? It was silent, it was just yeah, separate. Yeah. It 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 I mean you you can very clearly be challenged if you if you if you You've gone out, and the agreement is thirty-six months, and and uh, the intention is that this is mandatory. If you were to now, in twelve months' time, go and set up another panel to do the same thing, your existing panel members will challenge you. Um, there's, there's, there's absolutely, there's. Um, the, 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 this is the whole point of of today: is we've got to be a lot more deliberate upfront with how we plan these things. And if there was no mention up front about open or going out on a more regular basis, uh, it's it's very difficult to do that. Um, you know, if I was a bidder and I got into the first five, and you then created another panel, yo, you need to convince me that this was work you didn't anticipate. Um, this is the other thing with the minimum threshold, by the way. Um, uh, I'm not. I'm not a big fan of minimum threshold. Let's jump to Nicolette. Hi, Nicolette. Welcome, Nicolette. Nicolette Napier. Hi, welcome. Hi, Sean. How are you? Good, and you? Fine, thank you. Can't complain. Good. Um. So, Sean. Um. In terms of our entity, um, I've been listening to um the discussion, and what we do is like. We advertise for a panel and um, at the functionality stage, we only had one company um, that made it through. So instead of um, re-advertising, what we did was we advertised additions to the panel. Um, and that allowed us to then, because um, our management felt that uh, one person on the panel is not a panel. So we did additions to the panel. And that's the way that's the way we managed to get additional companies um, mm. onto the panel. And but we still kept it for the three years. Mm. So we did the additions six months after the original one had closed. And then the additions then came on, but mm. the, the end date of our panel is the same for all the companies three. all together. Mm. Mm. Now, um, I'm not so sure if if that's the right way to do it, but that's the way we've done it. 
And we found that that worked for us because um, with the second round, um, the companies that had originally come through the first time um, were then able to reevaluate their submission and give us better submissions and um, proposals. So that's the way it worked for us. Mm, mm, mm. Uh, in, in, in Nicolette, my, my view is is um, that um, would not be fair. Um, but if you have survived the audit process, if you've had no challenges from any of the existing bidders or the other bidders, um, then then uh, fortunately right now there's no legislation that would mean that you, this is irregular. Um, but uh, Joe, just fascinating, hey, Andres, you've got a last last word to you. Thank you. Yeah, the conversation is getting very interesting. <laughs> um, the um, and and uh, I I agree with you a lot. Last point as well. And again, the at the end of the day is if you just consider the wisdom that's already been shared here. Yeah, and you can you can avoid a lot of these pitfalls by just having the correct um, terminology and disclaimers in your bid documents. Where, yeah. you, for instance, I say I reserve the right. Yes, that exactly. If I have sufficient responses to to go out again, then you immediately avoid the potential of litigation on the um, uh, from the guys that that qualified initially. But maybe one last point, and I actually forgot it when I made my previous point, but I said this in a previous discussion on the same forum. Um, a technique, although I haven't seen it properly in practice yet, but we, we are advising our departments, they must seriously consider this. We actually returned bits to the department saying, consider the following technique to actually increase the number of competitors and and again we go right back to the millennium waste case where the whole issue of administrative um, um or let's call it innocent omissions mm, were mm, actually mm, dealt mm, with mm. and and if your panel tends to be small again put a term right up front saying the intent of creating this panel is a process that's inclusive Hmm. We, we we find a bidder for whatever um, 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 uh, administrative omission or uh, unintentional omission. You didn't sign the document. You didn't fill in this one. We will allow that to be to be corrected as part of the evaluation process. So try to not make the administrative criteria too um, um, restrictive, and yeah. and you end up reducing yeah. your panel. Yeah. Uh, the principle of inclusivity is is as everybody can join the paperwork must be and must be in order and, and that that principle has already been underscored with the introduction of CSD and specifically the issue of tax compliance where the CSD rules and the, the circular that came out with that specifically state that at the point a bid is evaluated and it's found the bidder is not tax compliant, the bidder must be given a reasonable opportunity to correct its tax matters. Now, to me, that makes the door open yeah. for a lot of the administrative activities that you can also open the door for that. And obviously, one need to draw the line somewhere and you have to set time frames. You, have to, you need to have quite strict criteria for how wide the doors open. And I always say the one item that the one thing you're not allowed to touch on a on an, any form of second bite of a bid is the price um if if a bid has issues with the price sadly that's the area you don't touch because as i yeah, said second yeah, bites yeah, yeah, yeah. get you into a world yeah. of trouble but um the principle is, is is inclusivity and secondly even and because now sometimes we don't want to to waste committee time or SEM administrative time of interacting with bidders during the evaluation process. You want to get it over and done with. There can't be during evaluation some kind of to and fro between bidders. You end up leaking confidential information and at the same time you are losing time. So the trick is postpone the enforcement of the criteria. And this is what I said before. Postpone it until bid award. So if the guy didn't sign whatever document 
or it didn't fill in the document correctly, but it does not impact your evaluation of that, that service provider of that bidder, then just leave it. Hmm. If he makes it to the short list um, beca because he got through functionality, then on the point of award, you say the awards conditionals, you subject to you filling in the or signing this particular document or fixing this administrative omission. And and again, nobody can sue you later on set. You gave him an unfair advantage because you only enforce the rule that you already had. And if he fails to to adhere to, to the rule, if he doesn't give you the document, then he's eliminated. Then he can't sue you either. Yeah. So so you, you sort of cover yourself both directions with that action. Good one. But again, it, it takes thinking on your feet. Yeah. And 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 unfortunately what we find is committees are so scared of making mistakes. Mm -hmm. Anything new is mm -hmm. taboo. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. and uh, and that particular one we, we, we still have our days trying to convince the committees it's acceptable <laughs> practice. Thank you. Good one. That's the concept of an accept or these are the conditional award. These are the you've got it on condition that you meet these requirements. It might be a paperwork type type of um, aspect. Uh, I said Andres was the last. Um, Komotsa, if it's a quick one, and then Pabala, if it's a quick one. Komotsa? Uh Sorry, 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 Sean. Uh, just a, a quick one outside of the topic. Outside sure. the topic that we're here. Sure, sure, yes, sure, sure. Yesterday we had. Yesterday we had a debate about a service provider who did not submit, who did not fully complete the SBD forms. Yes. But they've had their pricing schedule uh, fully attached to the bid document. Uh, yes. And then it was debat debatable whether you disqualify them for not filling the, uh, the, uh, the SBD forms because it's an administrative issue or you let them continue the bidding process. Is this MFMA so or PFMA? Uh, PFMA. PFMA. Okay, okay. I'll, I'll come back back to that. Let's just ask Pabala quickly. Is that, is that me, Sean? Yes. Hi, hi, Pabalo. Uh, hi, uh, uh, Sean. Sean, I, I, I really would uh, like to follow up with Andres on the point that he made. I have a situation where we were in we uh, we requested the bidder to uh, submit their their proof of professional registration and yes. And, you 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 actually know that um the 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 guy is registered because the subsequent um request of a specialist you can you can only obtain that uh, once you have uh, once you're done with the primary i e the uh professional registration so uh, uh the secondary requirement of a specialist uh, 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 but uh, you know, like inference can be drawn that for you to be able to get that specialist uh, registration, you must satisfy the, the mandatory. Um, I take, you know, we have to read between the lines. I mean, yeah, the, the secondary yeah. cannot be yeah. uh, cannot be attained without the primary. Uh, yeah. uh, that was my that was yeah. my yeah. argument. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. uh, would, yeah. would we have uh, would we have an authority that one say case law? Okay. Okay. Uh, when uh, one can actually substantiate that in front of the uh, the forum to say, look, uh, uh, that was the uh, so the yeah. the, uh, the the case law uh, that I yeah yeah. Um, thanks. Your your line is breaking up, Pabala. Let's uh, let's let's address both of the questions. Um, and Andres, you're welcome to come in here. So, um. All of this is is related to um, principles in law called substance and form. All right, one of one of the difficulties that we had with tax clearance in the old days is we used to disqualify them because they did not have a tax clearance certificate. And then what happened is we were challenged. The institutions were challenged because they disqualified people people because they didn't have the certificate, but yet. When they went to court and they got SARS to support them, SARS would say, yes, their tax affairs were in order. So, you know, the substance is, the, is, is their tax affairs were in order, but we disqualified them because of this paperwork and mission. 
Now, you've got to approach your SPDs in the same way. Even if you said in the tender document that if you don't, if, if you don't submit all the SPDs and they aren't completed and signed, we will disqualify. You've got to be very careful of, of applying that. Now, um, Andres mentioned the Millennium uh, Waste case. That's where a bidder completed an SPD for, but did not sign it. And they disqualified them, but it came back to, but, but hang on a sec, what is the purpose of the SPD for? And this, this comes back to the all pay case. The all pay case talks about the purpose of the provision. The purpose of the provision, Pabalo, is you want someone who's got the right qualification and experience to do the work. That's the purpose of that provision. Now, you've got, to, you've got to look at this and say, is there some other way we can establish that this person has met and can meet the purpose of that provision? And don't get hung up on the paperwork and whether this is in or this is out. Or, or if, if, if you know they can meet the purpose of that provision, then be very careful to disqualify them because you're going against that principle of substance over form. Um, it's, it's very difficult in court to defend yourself if you've disqualified somebody because they didn't give you a certified copy of a particular document, but yet they have that qualification. Very difficult for you to defend yourself. Um, I hope I hope that helps. Uh, any any thoughts, Andres, to add? Yeah, well, I, I think I'll just repeat myself, saying that the, the conditional award principle yeah, is yeah, yeah, solid. The yeah. Millennium case is definitely yeah the 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 one cited in in ninety nine point nine percent of yeah. the instances where you face to this problem. Yeah. Um. The, the the you just need to understand that. You, you need to be very carefully when you're dealing with matters that deals with evaluation criteria because... Yeah. Elimination criteria. Uh, yeah. uh, or elim well, yeah. elimination criteria is still... Uh, yeah, again, we're playing... Yeah, I, 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 yeah. 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 But yeah, okay. that's, that's, that's a short long bit. There yeah. is a workaround... Case yeah. law supports the whole principle. Yeah. So I don't see the problem. Actually, both those questions had the same answer. Exactly. Thanks. Exactly. Conditional award. Thank you. Okay, Michael. Sorry, on the issue of documents, there have yeah. been very different um, decisions by courts. At one stage, the court <laughs> held that the only documents that are really required are the ones that the state requires for signing a contract with a specific bidder. Yeah. So any other documents should not be used to disqualify a specific bidder because at that point in time, a contract is viable. The rest is information. And that information can be supplied on request, but it should not actually disqualify a bidder uh, at inception. Yeah. Okay. I mean, we've had... I, 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 agreed, in, agreed, agreed. We're on the same page. Agreed. We, we've had bids where the, the, the State Department asks us to submit a certified copy of our CSD um, oh, yeah. registration. Now, yeah. how can you do that? Do yeah. you take a laptop to the police station and ask them to have a look at the screen and yeah. then certify that the print is okay? So, uh, I think it's something that I brought up before. Uniformity in requests is actually something that is absolutely fundamental and i mean and this day and age with electronics being on the side of the state there is no reason for which the state cannot actually have a uniform system that applies to all municipalities all provinces all government departments with a single pool of information for each and every bidder and I mean, goodness gracious, you know, we put people on the moon, we're going to put people on Mars, and we just cannot sort out the most basic and the most <laughs> simple IT issues. Um, so, yeah, you know, we need to actually catch up a bit with what is available on the market and make it work in our favor. And then, you know, things are going Good to one. become streamlined and quick. Good one. To the National Treasury people on online, um, here, here's a four letter acronym ESPB. 
ESPD, I think it is. Yeah. Um, happy to happy to talk to you about that. We've got to simplify the documentation process. Komatsu, did we help or not? Yes, yes. I appreciate that. I appreciate that very much, uh, Sean. Uh, in addition to what Michael and Andres have just said, yes. in our institution, we have said whatever document you've got access to, the CIBD, CSD, tax certificates, all this other document that you, you've got working tools to be able to access those. If a service provider or a bidder did not submit those, you print them out, you indicate in the report that this uh, this way not there. We have attached them a supply chain and then the, the not this, or yeah, this yeah, yeah, they can yeah. be able to attend to those. Yeah. This is to minimize and uh, it's, a, it's a risk management strategy we put in place to close up the hands for litigations. Yeah, yeah. And and it's going to be even more important to do that. So instruction 4A PFMA on the CSD said you may not ask for information or documentation which already exists on CSD. So it's almost um, you know that that example that that um, Michael gave uh, you can't ask for a copy of your CSD because um, it's on the CSD. Anyway, that's PFMA 4A. Thanks, everybody. I hope this was of benefit. Um, I have a couple of people who we had spoken to about coming on next week. I hope that we're able to get the lady who's really, really good in construction law to come on. I know she's had a couple of health challenges, but let's see if uh, we can get her to join us. I hope this was of value to you and uh, has got you to think a little bit differently about um, about panels. And um, thanks to everybody for coming in, sharing their wisdom and experiences and perspectives and for your questions. And um, look forward to uh, to next Wednesday. All the best. Have a great week. Thanks, John. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, John. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Michael. Kanilwe. Ndiwet. Thanks, everybody. There you are. Gee, that was long. Cheerio. Thank you. Is uh bye bye, uh Venti. Um Thank you, Sean, uh, for your informative session. Thanks. Thanks to uh, all the Oswald. contributors. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. Uh, I just want to see if Emerson is online today. Emerson is not. Emerson is celebrating his birthday. Okay. Uh, to any, anybody who's celebrating their birthday, happy birthday. All the best, everybody.